Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Raj Kumar. I'm the Vice Chancellor of Hope Regional Global University. Good evening to our friends in Far East and Australia. Good morning to people who are watching us in North America and Canada. We are uh, in the second day of the Global Virtual Conference on reimagining and transforming the future of law schools and legal education. We are also celebrating today India's Constitution Day on 26th November 1949, we adopted the Indian Constitution and that day has been since celebrated as Law Day and for the last few years as Constitution Day. We are also very fortunate that to mark this special occasion, we are organizing the Constitution Day Forum as a plenary panel on the theme Women, Law and the Legal Profession. Early this morning, we had the Constitution Day lecture delivered by Honorable Dr. Justice D.Y. Chandrachud, Judge of Supreme Court of India, and also shared reflections of Professor Upendra Bakshi, another colleague of ours at Jindal Global Law School. The issue of women, law, and social change, uh, social change has been a subject matter of a number of discussions. But to have a sharper focus on the role of women and law in the legal profession has been less studied and less examined. We are very delighted that we have with us Honorable Ms. Justice Geeta Mittal, the Chief Justice of the High Court of Jammu and Kashmir, who will be delivering the keynote address. We are also very fortunate that we have Ms. Geeta Ramasishan, advocate of the Madras High Court, who will also be delivering the presidential address. I also want to thank and appreciate the presence of my colleague, Professor Juma Sen, Associate Professor at Jindal Global Law School, who will be delivering a special address drawing upon her own research. Now, the question of uh, role and representation and indeed participation of women in the legal profession in India has been a subject matter of a number of discussions. Simply sp speaking, in terms of pure statistics itself, it's, uh, it's uh, hugely embarrassing. Nearly 7% of judges uh, in 25 high courts, uh, you know, we have, uh, and, and in fact, the data shows even more uh, that there are six uh, high courts which do not have even a single, uh, uh, you know, uh, woman judge as well. And of course, we can discuss and debate about the data, but more importantly, the real question as we celebrate the Constitution Day is that to what extent we can shape the future of Indian democracy and indeed the Indian legal profession by recognizing the challenge of the deeply institutionalized discrimination that is prevalent in the legal profession. To what extent women contest these notions of the legal profession and how we as a society need to contest this notion of law and the legal profession itself. The distinguished speakers who we have with us today will be discussing some of these issues. I will be taking some of the questions uh, shared from the audience who are watching. We are live on Facebook and YouTube. With those words, I am going to request Honorable Ms. Justice Geeta Mittal to begin this plenary panel with her keynote address. Justice Mittal, over to you. Thank you very much, Raj. Uh, a greeting which I think reaches out from South Africa all the way to North America, from uh, South America all the way to extreme north of Asia and Europe, it would be Namaskar, Assalamu Alaikum Salam. Namaskar is a greeting which I think the world over is being adopted and followed given the current pandemic. I wish all of you good health and I wish all of you greetings on this very special day which is celebrated as Constitution Day in India. It is a matter of grave concern for me that conversations which I heard 30 years ago or 40 years ago when I joined the legal profession in 1981 are still relevant and seriously an issue even today. For this reason, the conversation in this session of the, this very important conference is extremely significant. I congratulate the Jindal Global Law School and the OP, OP Jindal Global University for enabling this dialogue. Thank you, Professor Rajkumar and your entire team for giving me this opportunity to join you in this program. The glass ceiling is one of the most compelling metaphors for analyzing inequalities between men and women in the workplace. It applies to women as a group who are kept from advancing higher because of their gender. The glass ceiling implies the existence of an impermeable barrier that blocks the vertical mobility of women. 
Below this barrier, women are able to get promoted. Beyond this, they are not. Such a situation can be considered the limiting case of a more general phenomenon, that is, situations in which the disadvantaged women as a group face related relative to men, which intensifies as they move up organizational hierarchies. This ubiquitous glass ceiling obstructs women across jurisdictions and subjects women to unequal treatment all over the world. In the context of the legal profession as well, history is replete with examples of regressive gender perspectives. The eminent jurist Lord Coke in England about 350 years ago openly stated that, and I quote, women are generally unfitted for the duties of the legal profession. Female attorneys at law were unknown in England and a proposition that a woman should enter the courts at Westminster Hall in that capacity or as a barrister would have created hardly less astonishment than that one that she should ascend the bench or be elected to a seat in the House of Commons." Unquote. This is from Inri Bradwell, 1850. It is reported at 1850, 55.35. Furthermore, in 1914, a three-judge bench of the Court of Appeals in Bob versus the Law Society, by relying on the positive prohibition of the common law of England, denied entry into the legal profession to women. Historically, in the Indian context, on the 29th of August, 1960, a special bench, 1916, a special bench of the Calcutta High Court, Inri Regina Guha, refused the enrollment of Miss Regina Guha as a pleader it was observed that the legislative intent of the Indian legislature while passing the Legal Practitioners Act of 1879 was, and I'm quoting the court here, which said that, that it would be repugnant to the idea of decorum to permit women to join in what I may call the rough and tumble of the forensic arena, unquote. It was only in 1921 one, that the Allahabad High Court ignored the above decision of the Calcutta High Court and Cornelia Sorabji was admitted as a vakil on 24th August, 1921. Finally, it was on the 28th of January, February, 1923, that the Legal Practitioners Women Act was passed, removing all doubts about the eligibility of women to be enrolled, as well as to practice as legal practitioners. Taking a statistical view, in 1999, only 10% of the total lawyers admitted to the bar were females. In recent times, India's top law firms are said to have only 30% women partners, a third of these firms having a gender ratio below 20%. In its over five decades of existence, the position of designation of women as senior advocates in the Supreme Court, which is equal, which is called the silks uh, in the UK, is also deplorable. In 1977, Justice Leela Seth was the first woman who was designated as a senior advocate by the Supreme Court. The next designation of a woman advocate as senior counsel happened only in the year 2007, when Justice Indu Malhotra became only the second woman to be des so designated. The position regarding designation of women advocates as senior counsels in the high courts is not much different. Gender bias is reportedly prevalent, widely prevalent in law firms and companies as well. A study conducted with 81 women working in law firms revealed that women were being allocated unchallenging work, being forced to remain content with lower professional fees than their male counterparts, and being denied benefits and promotions in corporate positions job, and jobs. Moreover, 74% of the women interviewed felt that their employers had made little effort in promoting or mentoring women within the organization. Clearly, women remain severely underrepresented in the legal profession. While the number of women graduating from law schools and working at junior levels is equal to their male counterparts, this does not translate to equal representation at the higher levels. More women are entering the legal profession every day, but their upward mobility seems to be hampered due to systemic discrimination. Though women's participation in the Indian judiciary has increased slowly in the recent decades, as at present, the position is abysmal. As Raj has pointed out, 
out of the 673 sitting judges of the high courts of the high courts in india only 73 are women i am happen to be the only woman chief justice out of the 28 high courts 25 high courts in india in the 70 years since the supreme court was established only eight women have ever been appointed as judges currently out of 30 judges at the supreme court only two are women additionally availing maternity leave benefits often has had negative impact on women's careers both as lawyers as well as in the judiciary this has included losing out on promotions despite deserving the same moreover most corporate law firms are unwilling to invest in women and view maternity benefits as a drain on their resources it is thus not uncommon for women to be inquired about their marital status status and plans of having children at job interviews questions which are never asked of men i recollect an incident when i was in legal practice a young lawyer was at an advanced stage of pregnancy and was ad advised against driving by her obstetrician she was therefore compelled to send a colleague to seek a short adjournment in a family matter which she was conducting the trial judge was re reluctant in acceding to the request and had commented doesn't she know that there is no maternity leave for a lawyer in the profession so far as the judiciary is concerned i recollect an incident in which the annual confidential report of a woman judge was downgraded because she had could not meet the required unit criteria regarding disposal of cases her only fault was that she had been compelled to be on medical as well as maternity leave for which reason she did not have the number of days of work required to enable her to meet the required unit criteria instances abound where women working in firms are expected or asked to leave a little earlier than their male counterparts especially if they take public transport Pub working late and traveling alone at night is considered particularly unsafe for women this reduces their time in office which leads them to not getting assigned important briefs moreover certain tasks such as talking to a police officer are sometimes reserved for men since it is considered unsafe for women to go alone for such interviews women are also kept out of entire fields of practice such as criminal law due to stereotypes about the practice it is not uncommon for a woman to hear that she should not practice criminal law since it may be dangerous or dirty there is a notion that young women entering the field should stay away from criminal law since they would not be able to handle it and would be required to surround themselves with questionable people women are expected to pursue softer fields such as family and child custody laws which fits their socially assigned roles as caregivers and peacemakers women face stereotyping not only from their male counterparts but also from clients who question their competency clients tend to assume that a woman lawyer is too soft to manage an aggressive negotiation or a complex litigation on the flip side of this however women are regarded as being too loud or dominant if they are bold in their approach any display of emotions is dismissed as hormonal and plays into the stereotype of women being irrational and overly sensitive Stere similar stereotyping is prevalent in judicial assignments and appointments as well at this juncture i am reminded of what judge linda ludgate in pennsylvania us has on a plate in her chamber it says will the man who said it cannot be done get out of the way of the woman who is doing it women lawyers face sexual harassment in varied ways from colleagues senior lawyers judges and even clients law students and interns are particularly vulnerable to such harassment sexual harassment laws usually address harassment at the workplace however for a lot of women lawyers the workplace is the courts lawyers practicing in courts are not employees of the judges this makes it extremely difficult for a woman to seek redress about such behavior complaining of harassment also has huge repercussions on the woman's future career because of the power which is wielded against the by the respondent in the legal profession furthermore i may recount two first hand accounts of women struggling to fend for an opportunity to learn this is not in too far uh, recent past uh, and is in the recent past i recollect the experiences of two of my law researchers which have left an indelible mark 
on my mind as well as heart. I will not withhold her name, but use the appellation N for her, was a young girl whose late father was a director in a government position and the mother a lawyer in Patna. She was brought up in a conservative background. Her family expected that she would get married on completion of a schooling, which was resisting, which she was resisting, wanting to go for higher education and acquisition of a professional degree. Therefore, at the time of a class 12 school leaving board exams, she went to the examination hall and spent the entire duration of three hours without writing a single word on her answer sheets. She repeated this three year, for three consecutive years, consequently failing the examination for three years. This made her family realize her and understand her determination and permitted her to join a bachelor's program in Delhi. Thereafter, despite the family pressure and consequential financial restraints, she went on to pursue her LLB course in Delhi and is now enrolled with a lawyer as a lawyer with the bar. Why I always uh, feel a little uh, concerned about N's progress is because this, these three years cost her uh, um, the very valuable opportunity of trying for a judicial appointment as she be uh, became age barred for taking the requisite exam. R was another law researcher who came to me from an upper middle class, well-placed family from Delhi. Her mother, mother was a director in a premier educational institution. Yet, before R could finish her five-year law course, her parents had published a matrimonial advertisement inviting suitors for her marriage without even telling her of the same. As a result, this young girl faced extreme insecurity and apprehension as to whether she would be able, permitted to or be able to achieve her dream and aspiration of a career in law. Many years ago, in a conversation with several judges, including one member of the High Court Collegium, which had recommended six names for appointment of judge, uh, appointment as judges of the Delhi High Court, I had pointed out towards the absence of a single woman lawyer's name on the list. To this came the reaction from the judge on the Collegium. He asked, don't you think there are enough women? He asked, how many of you are there on the bench? I had answered, we are seven, seven out of the 35 then. To this came the reaction, don't you think there are enough women on the bench? I couldn't resist asking the gentleman judge, don't you think there are enough men on the bench? Professor Ved Kumari, a law professor at the Delhi University, who had been appointed as a chairperson of the Delhi Judicial Academy, had following very interesting observations to make after her experience at the judicial in the judicial trainings. She had observed that merely increasing the number of women judges at the lower level did not necessarily lead to an increase in the appointment of women judges in the higher judiciary, and that there has to be a definite policy towards the same. She has also observed that there is extreme reluctance between both male and female judges to gender sensitization programs at every level. From the word go, the reaction is that there has been oversensitization. Ved also observed how almost all women judges were wanting out of the outstation weekend trip, which was organized for institutional bonding for the trainee judges. These women judges espoused family commitments as being the difficulty. It was clearly evident that families felt that such a trip was not an essential part of the work of the judge and husbands were unwilling to take on the, any additional responsibility to facilitate the uh, judge in going for the outing. The women judges had no option and were not permitted to negotiate with the families. The male judges, however, had no such problems. Thereafter, the Delhi High Court stated that no exemptions could be permitted from the trip. As a result, the outing was made compulsory for all participants of the training program. An interesting response of a woman judge was to the following effect. One judge reacted, hey, this is great. I can always say that there is no exemption from any such program in the future. Another lay woman judge went on the more normative route stating, and I quote, I'm very unhappy that the High Court has permitted no exemptions. I have been able to cook for only one day, so my husband and two children will be happy. But who will do it for the second day or thereafter? It will be very difficult for them. 
these two con these conversations highlight a very significant aspect of the working of women judges and that is that they are either performing judicial duties or discharging familial responsibilities as part of this every minute of their extra time is utilized in socializing in socializations involving only the extended family on the other hand male judges are involved in institutional bonding exercises and socializations and are thus present at all functions women never think of institutional socialization in their as their as an option in their optional time preconceptions surrounding women's roles and abilities biases in recruitment and nomination processes and lack of access to informal networks of communications are all part and forms of discrimination being faced by women across multifarious contexts different standards of performance evaluation and little or no access to critical developmental assignments such as memberships on highly visible task forces and committees or important roster allocations is further reflective of the impunity with which such behavior is being meted out to women both in the legal profession as well as in judicial appointments women are expected to shoulder the burden of child care and domestic duties single handedly this is also seen as a liability by recruiters inflexible hours and often hostile work environments make it more difficult for women to manage a work life balance furthermore organizations seldom promote family friendly workplace policies or provide supportive infrastructure gender based discrimination is a lived reality for many women it is no different in the legal profession in india women face caste as well as gender based discrimination both at home as well as the workplace the lack of vigorous law enforcement allows for such counterproductive behavior and harassment by colleagues the reporting and dissemination of information relevant to glass ceiling issues is completely inadequate if at all weaknesses in the collection of employment related data makes it difficult to ascertain the status of groups at the managerial level and to disaggregate the data justice mary jean coon chief justice of the minnesota supreme court once stated and i quote a wise old man and a wise old woman reach the very same conclusion unquote christopher pankhurst has also said i quote ability is sexless sexless unquote it would thus be useful to analyze why such disparities exist for women despite having merit ability qualifications as well as experiences equal to if not more than that of men chief justice beverly mclachlan of the supreme court of canada has drawn a caution that the arguments towards appointment of women judges is not to suggest that only women can make decisions that take into account women's perspectives the chief justice however does say that it cannot be denied that women do provide a useful perspective on legal issues that arise before the courts the same can be said for women lawyers and senior advocates the importance of gender diversity cannot be overstated it is particularly significant in the legal profession where the presence of women plays a symbolic role in upholding the ideal of equality helps maintain confidence in the legitimacy fairness and impartiality of the justice system especially amongst the disadvantaged groups diversity on the bench and in the bar reflects a more inclusive representation of society and leads to a wider range of considerations in reaching arguments it brings varied perspectives values experiences and sensitivities to the advocacy and the judiciary which would prove instrumental in generating creative and just solutions further propel propelling change towards what the law requires women professionals thus have to anticipate familial demands while juggling with professional commitments creating and enabling environments by way of fairly recognizing the ability and worth of women professionals having uniform standards for evaluation of merit permitting flexible timings ensuring creches and child care rooms for lactating mothers should be an integral part of every workspace be it a lawyer's chamber 
a law firm's offices or the court complexes. Only then would discrimination stand removed and equality, gender equality achieved. Towards this end, I have mandated childcare spaces and creches in court, which stand inaugurated in the various union territories of Jammu and Kashmir, amongst others in Srinagar, Gandharbal, Badgam, Samba, and a few others. In the words of Michelle Obama, and I quote, no country can truly flourish if it stifles the potential of its women and deprives itself on the contribution of half its citizens, unquote. It is truly extremely troublesome for me that we are now in 2020, at the end of 2020, are still talking of discrimination, glass ceilings, and deprivation so far as women professionals are concerned. With this thought in mind, as has been said by Mich uh, Michelle Obama, let us envision and strive towards a fairer tomorrow, a tomorrow where equality is the norm and diversity and inclusion its close companions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for a compelling tour de force on the uh, you know, journey, but most importantly, some of the very critical issues that are confronting the state of judiciary, the legal profession, including the role of women in law. We will come back to some of those issues very shortly. Now, I have great pleasure in inviting Ms. Geeta Ramaseshan, Advocate Vadas High Court, to deliver the presidential address. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Ms. Justice Geeta Mittal, Chief Justice of Jammu and Kashmir, Dr. Rajkumar, Dr. Juma Sen, I give it a great privilege to be giving uh, you the presidential address on women law and the legal profession. Given the fact that women today constitute half the numbers in law institutions, and we take maybe many things for granted, it is necessary that we take a peek into the not so distant past about our entry into the field. I know that uh, Dr. Juma Sen has done an excellent work on uh, the first women lawyers of India and uh, Justice Geeta Mittal has made a reference to it, but I would still need to go a little bit into those areas to give a historicity into where we are today. It was just about 100 years ago or so that Regina Guha of Calcutta wanted to practice uh, what was not permitted and a spirited battle wherein the term person in the Legal Practitioners Act was argued to include women was not accepted. A four member bench of the Calcutta High Court held that she was not entitled to enroll as a pleader. In 1921, you had Sudanshana Wala Hazra of the Patna High Court who again challenged the issue pertaining to the General Clauses Act. And here is what the court held. And I just wanted to, of course, the court did not permit her to do so and said that the act should be amended. But I just need, I wanted to quote to you what the bench held. An appeal has also been made to us on the ground of intelligence and capacity of women to be fit compeers of men in the forensic area and that the rapid advancement of the country in the matter of education amongst females require that these rights in all spheres, including the profession of pleader, should be recognized as being equal with men. This is quite true, is the observation of the court. But having held that, they went ahead saying that the, they recommended the changing the law, even though by that time, Cornelia Sorabji was already enrolled as a vakil in Allahabad. The references that the court made in these cases was to <coughs> Abibs versus Law Society, the UK judgment, and Bradwell versus Illinois, both of which were cases that challenged the entry of women into the legal profession. All the three Indian women were highly qualified, yet had to face extraordinary hurdles when it came to wanting to practice in the legal profession. Cornelia, as is known, could only represent Vardhanashi and minors under the Guardian and Wards Act. She could not argue. Of course, the Legal Practitioners Act was amended. Women made a mark and continue to make a mark. <clears throat> 
So how do we understand equality today? And I just want to go not just into us as practitioners of law, but also understand equality, the way it is structured in some of the in the in some of the legislations and in the way in which most people understand. Equality today is understood either through the lens of a formal model or through the protectionist model. Now the con the Women's Convention, the CEDAW, addresses equality of what of what needs to be extremely relevant from the substantive point of view. But if you look at our laws, you will find that either they are in the formal model or in the protectionist model. And I'll just give you two examples. Let's take the Hindu Marriage Act and let's look at interim maintenance and permanent maintenance. This is the only statute that actually came in 1955 that address or that require both the male and the female could be made liable to pay maintenance to their spouse. Such a provision does not exist in the Special Marriage Act. It does not exist in the other laws at all. Question is, of course, you may say, why not today women are equal? Why should a woman not be asked to pay maintenance to her spouse? And that is coming from an understanding of a formal model of equality because this provision in many instances has been used to harass women and not taking note of the fact that a woman's contribution is not just the salary which she may earn more than that of her husband but also the contribution that she does to the home. This is only a small example that I'm giving you. But let me also give you another example of the protectionist model. The common understanding, let's say, in criminal law of what we understand as protective custody. Courts routinely direct women to a shelter home on the ground that in a case, like let's take, for example, a sexual assault. Instances of women who is the survivor victim being sent to the shelter home are very common. But the perpetrators of the offense invariably come out on the basis of bail. Now, it is not to say that in a given case, a woman may require a shelter that the entire understanding of the notion of protective custody comes from the fact that women need protection. Therefore, in a given situation, they could require custody, irrespective of the fact whether she was economically within her parameters, independent, contributing to a livelihood, taking care of her children, etc. The entire study of protective custody would give us these instances. The third kind of equality, which is the substantive model of equality, which we find in my view under Article 15, which say that the state can make special laws in favor of women and children. In the structure of a substantive model is not easily understood. And it was only recently in the Sabri Malla judgment where uh, Justice Chandra Chuth has made a detailed observation on the issue of substantive equality. So, where do we as women lawyers stand or find ourselves? In the examples that Justice Gita Mittal gave us, in various examples that I want to share with you, we are viewed only through the prism of the formal model where, you know, you're equal, you want to be in this profession, you have to deal with it like a man. So don't expect maternity leave. You have to work from morning to night. Don't expect any other facility is the common understanding of our colleagues, of judges, of various people in the judicial process. So let's take this. Therefore, for example, you do not have crashes in 
any of the places. You don't even have restrooms in many of the trial courts. Justice Mittal spoke about crashes. It, it required a court order from her to see that these were put in motion in the various courts in JNK. It required a lot of, uh, uh, you know, in Tamil Nadu, in the Madras High Court, it required a lot of uh, not protests but demands from women lawyers for a crash to be put in the campus. So, the next, of course, comes not just this, but into the realm of protectionist approach. Uh, yes, women are not allowed to practice criminal law. They are not encouraged to practice criminal law. Because, you know, uh, examples again with Justice Gita Mittal gave us. Uh, when I joined the bar, there were many seniors who would not take any woman as a junior. They simply felt that some seniors argued that they wouldn't, they did not want to keep, uh, you know, they couldn't have women working late nights. But some seniors felt that having women in their offices could cause some kind of a problem. Now, of course, things have changed a lot. Uh, senior lawyers, most lawyers want a woman junior. That the examples that I gave you was not so much in the distant parts. How do we develop clientele? That's a much greater challenge. Uh, you know, most of the time, if it is word of mouth, getting a vase is difficult for a woman. And here I'm not talking about women lawyers in cities or in fairly urban areas. If you look at smaller towns, it's very hard for women to make a mark. It's very hard for women to find an office. It's very hard for women to develop clientele and it is very hard for women to be taken seriously. Uh, you can find extreme aggression from the men in trial courts, uh, you know, in the form of, you know, especially in terms of litigation, when a woman represents a client in a magistrate court. And this aggression, to my mind, has translated itself into a into more into more aggression. Well, while I think 30 years ago, it was more uh, paternalistic in terms of, you know, okay, you're a young woman, maybe you should not do these things. Maybe you can do only family law. Maybe you can do only civil law. And But there was some kind of an encouragement. Today, there can be a strong aggression if young, smart women make their presentations in the courts. So the implicit gender bias swings from a formal to a protectionist model when it comes to women practicing in a court of law. A greater challenge, of course, is to balance with the private and the professional life. Uh, support systems are required, of course, um, at home. And if that support system is not available, it's very hard in the legal profession for women to make a mark. However, one of the advantage I would say is that uh, for women, this is an easier profession to come back. I mean, you take a break if you have a family, you can also come back easily into the profession. I look at the profession pyramidical, like a pyramid. Uh, the top are the very big hotshot senior lawyers and the bottom of course are even within the men, a lot of lawyers who struggle. So for women to actually reach midway, I would say, uh, you know, in this uh, area, it is a struggling profession in litigation, even for men, but for women, it's the struggle is double. 
So for women to actually reach even midway within the profession, it is a strong struggle. Uh, so I think uh, the challenge for young women, if you want to enter into litigation, is that it is a very challenging profession. It is fascinating. It is interesting. It is frustrating. But it has its own merits if you stay on and push yourself through in more ways than one. You do need, of course, a great support system. Find out lawyers who are encouraging to take you on board, of which there are plenty now because offices are also requiring competent good lawyers. And now there is also a tendency to think that women lawyers are much more competent. And therefore, on this push, if you start, I am sure most of you who are here, who uh, you know want to go ahead in the profession in more ways than one in litigation, would definitely make a very strong mark. I also want to say that today the profession or the degree of law offers you far greater opportunities than what it did in our days, where you know we only had litigation as an option or maybe teaching. It was nothing else was an option, but today the options are very high and the sky therefore will be your limit. The glass ceiling in this profession is very complex. Uh, how do you rate a glass ceiling? Are you rating it on the basis of income or are you rating it on the basis of a, uh, you know, fairly very successful lawyer in a particular field in a particular town who may not be charging that many fees as the men, but would be very successful. So understanding the glass ceiling also in this profession is complex. Yes, I agree that uh, women probably charge less than that of men, but I think that is something which uh, which would be, uh, uh, you know, it's only a temporary phenomena. It would actually go ahead as you come through. In my own experience, I want to end with that is I, uh, a large part of my criminal law practice was because of the legal aid movement in Tamil Nadu. We had a very strong legal aid movement, which was, and the, and the secretary and others were very encouraging of us women lawyers. They would push our boundaries to go to the police station, uh, file criminal cases, file public interest litigations, etc., which maybe would not have come in, in my way or in the way of many other women who were practicing at that time. And I think uh, that I just wanted to end with my own experience on that score, except to say that the sky would be the limit, I would say, and not look at it as a glass ceiling. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramasation, for that uh, uh, lot of personal reflection, but also resonating with a lot of hope and aspiration for the young people who are aspiring to be part of the legal profession. Uh, I'm going to quickly ask Professor Juma Sen, uh, my colleague, uh, to give her reflections and also talk about the study. Uh, we want to we want to have take some questions as well. So Juma, if you can uh, do a eight minute to ten minute presentation, that'd be nice. Okay. Uh uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Raj. Uh, thank you, uh, distinguished panel. And it is always a little intimidating to uh, speak in the presence of uh, such distinguished speakers. Uh, so uh, I have two cards, uh, uh, you know, as a speaker here, uh, as someone who has practiced in the courts, uh, and as someone who has uh, been privileged to be exposed to a lot of archival materials of late while uh, trying to research and recreate the lives of some of these early women lawyers in the legal profession as part of my book on the same subject. Uh, so I uh, will speak a bit about the making of the professional legal women subject in the late 19th uh, and the early uh, part of the 20th century uh, through some of the pioneer uh, portiers. Uh, legal historians generally, you know, legal historians of early women lawyers are usually unanimous in their opinion that naming these pioneers is just the start. The source problem proves to be a gigantic uh, obstruction uh, when one tries to reconstruct what it was like to be one of these pioneers. Uh, personal records are rarely kept and uh, it becomes uh, extremely difficult to fill in the 
context of their lives uh, and in addition to that there is another challenge that of you know that of uh, capturing the complexity of the uh, lives of these women who were lone voyagers and often the only women to uh, challenge male exclu exclusivity by attempting to enter the legal professions and they often uh, you know they often created uh, uh, their life because there was no models of the lives they wanted to live you know this making the sort of the primary task of uh, their uh, biographers uh, to reinvent the lives their subjects led somewhat uh, difficult uh, but my i think the first thing uh, i i would i would really sort of you know that's the, something that i have been thinking is that what was so unique about the late 19th and the early 20th uh, centuries that women started knocking on the doors of the legal profession across jurisdictions in these decades and 19th century is admittedly the uh, you know the the age of emergence of modern professions owing to a number of factors and law was no exception either uh, history in fact shows that the idea of law as a distinct profession was being consolidated during this age uh, leading to the sort of the re, sort of you know the reconfigurations of interesting questions like who could practice law and how does one regulate the legal profession along with the setting up of uh, bar associations uh, and as well you know law schools in different parts of the world a uh, 19th and early 20th century was also the period marked by women's movement for equal rights across the globe leading to a number of significant law reforms in the legal status of women especially with respect to property and uh, family and and there was in addition to that there was you know the complex uh you know very complex rather transnational feminist solidarity was fought between british women lawyers and indian women who were imperial subjects while women across several jurisdictions attempted to enter the legal profession uh the the freedom struggle had uh, legitimized women's uh, involvement outside the home and family and it provided a fertile ground for women to access legal profession in addition to that this period also witnessed the proliferation of women litigants before the courts owing to a number of factors including a reform in women's legal status which brought more and more women in contact with law so the 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 the, the figure of the woman in parda it, it kind of emerges as a category bearing rights you know whose needs could be served better by women lawyers so these therefore became the conditions of emergence of women lawyers in the sort of in this very traditionally masculinist profession during this period uh, the most well known of these women uh, was indeed cornelia sorabji was the first woman to study law in oxford the first woman lawyer uh, in british india one of the uh, earliest women barristers and possibly the first woman to practice in the lahabad and the calcutta high courts uh she is you know rightfully described as a pioneer and she claimed her place as one of the you know as as an as an individual bearing several identities that of an indian subject of the empire and that of a professional citizen and above all that of a you know that of a woman because and she negotiated her way into the legal profession by arguing that indian women litigants needed uh, indian women lawyers who were uniquely placed to offer professional guidance and comfort uh Sorabji navigated her fem feminism although she never called herself a feminist uh, you know with her claim to the nation and empire in a in a very complex language of professional citizenship which was unique and baffling at the same time uh, her initial years as a and she you know as a sort of like a roving practitioner of law and subsequently as a lawyer for uh, women in parda have been subject of some critical study in recent years for legal historians uh, who have who were interrogating the legal profession the other two uh, remarkable women were regina guha and sudhanshu bala hazras and i have done some work on uh, both their lives and their names have been lost in history both these women formally challenged the legal practitioners act which deemed women were not persons within the meaning of the legal profession Regina Guha's case was the first person's case in India uh, you know like it was pointed by uh, the previous speakers she in the court records if you actually look at the court records they indicate that uh, she after obtaining a bachelor's of law degree from Calcutta University this was 1916 she submitted an application for admission to be enrolled as a pleader in the Alipur district court which was subsequently forwarded by the Calcutta high court because they did not know how to deal with the question of a woman uh, you know trying to get admitted uh, you know to the role Uh, and since this was the first instance of an application by a lady for enrollment of uh, uh, you know as, as a pleader her application was heard by a special bench of the uh, you know of the judicial 
uh, of the of the of the of the of the calcutta high court uh, for the uh, determination of the question of whether the legal practitioners act uh, contemplated women practitioners uh, and a bench of five judges heard her application they unanimously came to the conclusion that men are entitled to be admitted as pleaders uh, she was turned away from the doors of the legal profession she embraced her life as a headmistress of the jewish girls school she did not live long actually you know at least not long enough to see the passage of the law amending the uh, status quo uh, and she passed away 3 years uh, after you know uh, you know in 19 uh, uh, 1919 she passed away so 3 years after calcutta high court judgment was delivered uh, there were others like uh, mithan tata for example who was not only the first indian woman to become a barrister but was also someone who actively participated in the debate surrounding uh, votes for women in england uh, along with her ma- mother uh, hirabai these were like widely covered uh, by the uh, by the british uh, media at that point of time their efforts were instrumental in providing uh, suffrage to indian women uh, the sex this disqualification removal act was finally passed in 1919 which was very very instrumental in pushing for a formal campaign in india to amend the legal practitioners act of 1879 and allow a women entry into the legal profession uh, mithan tata was also the founder of indian federation of women lawyers and served as the vice president of the international federation of women lawyers uh, in her formative years she was an she was an indian suffragist later uh, you know as a student of oxford university and was the first lawyer to practice in the uh, bombay high court she was also very active uh, in uh, you know she was actively involved in the all india women's conference serving as its uh, you know as its president and played very important roles in the amendment of the parsi marriage act and the drafting of the hindu code bills we don't know these uh, stories because we don't think of uh, these women when we think of the idea of this you know the, the, uh, sort of a you know a pioneer lawyer uh, sudhan shubala uh, uh, you know had initiated the second persons case in india uh, which would subsequently generate a campaign to uh, amend the law surrounding the regulation of the legal profession uh, she was born to bengali christian parents and uh, after their untimely death she as well her uh, her elder sister uh, shaila bala both of them were adopted by uh, a friend of their father who was the architect of modern orissa madhusudan das who was a lawyer himself and had a you know had a successful practice uh, she in, you know she recounts in her memoir that how she intended to follow the footsteps of madhudas uh and uh, she studied law and faced the first barrier when she wanted to write her preliminary law exam and was denied and then there was a second barrier when uh, after qualifying she was not allowed to enroll as a pleader in the patna district court uh the patna district court incidentally uh, the, not the district court the high court uh, incidentally uh, they also followed the regina guha's case and they ruled that sudhan shwala was not a person within the meaning of the legal practitioners act and hence not allowed to enter the legal profession and in what can be described as a riveting uh, tale of resistance sudhanshu bala along with her sister shaila bala you know uh, uh, who i already said who was a very prominent figure in the in the women's movement in the uh, in the early 20th uh, century and the the, fa- the adoptive father madhusudan das they launched a campaign for the amendment of the legal practitioners act from moving uh, they also like you know uh, they, they they wanted to move to the privy council to uh, they wrote uh, uh, to the members of the central legislative assembly and the law was uh and uh, the law was finally pa- amended in 1923 with the legal uh, practitioners women's act clarifying that women were persons within the meaning of the law and that they could practice there were other uh, pioneers like sham kumari uh khan who was born sham kumari nehru who had a very very prominent practice uh, who was one of the uh, uh, lawyers uh, who defended yashpal a political prisoner in the meerat conspiracy case uh, uh, there you know there was durga bai deshmukh there was anna chandi there were so many uh, you know so many others now uh, so when when these so these while these women were negotiating their professional space including the terms on which they were required to conduct themselves the legal profession too was adjusting itself to these negotiations and changes and you actually see like how these changes were taking place because you know from sartorial negotiations of women lawyers attire and robes to you know toil is a question of toil is for women in the court house which uh, one of the earlier speakers already mentioned uh to uh you know to, to you know because these all all traditionally always catered to men to you know to having very limited access to the bar library these women were navigating inhospitable spaces which were still guarded by the hostile gentlemen's uh club 
uh, I just want to conclude. Uh, you know, I can go on and on about all these you know lives of all these women, but I know that I have been uh, asked to uh, you know wrap up uh, you know eight minutes. Uh, I just want to conclude that uh, you know by saying that 2023 marks the hundred years uh, since the passage of the Legal Practitioners Act, uh, you know Women's Act 1923, and it is perhaps a good time to reflect on these and curate the lives uh, you know lives including the public. Private as well as professional lives of these women in the legal profession, uh, it may demonstrate the complex and multiple negotiations uh, these early women lawyers did, and also explore the individual circumstances of these women and the historical context in which these uh, women presented their claims and lived their lives. Uh, on a more personal and uh, uh, you know institutional note, uh, you know I would actually uh, you know th this is probably directed at you know Raj uh, directly that at you know at, at JGLS we have more than fifty percent women as law professors and uh, you know fifty percent more than fifty percent women are in um, leadership positions and we should perhaps think about taking a lead in setting up a hundred years of women in legal profession project in a very disciplined manner. Similar projects have been taken, have been uh, sort of instituted in other institutions. There's, there's one in Australia, there's one in UK. Uh, we should do have one here as well. Uh, on that note, I will conclude. I think I'm in time, eight minutes on my watch. Juma has, uh, thank you so much, Juma. Juma has uh, strategically provided a public pitch on that project. So very exciting. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Juma, for that. So listen, we have a few minutes, and so we need to quickly get into these Questions. So, ma'am, let me start with this. There are several questions. A lot of people are asking lots of questions. So, uh, I know Justice Geeta Mittal is uh, uh, the Chief Justice of the JNK High Court. So, I'm conscious of the fact that she may or may not like to answer some of these questions. So, ma'am, one major question, and I'm going to re uh, uh, paraphrase the question is this is regarding, you know, women's, uh, women's appointment as in appointment of women as judges. You know, in the, if you look at the reservation policy when it comes to OBCs and SCSTs historically, uh, till such time, uh, you know, the efforts to diversify was pursued through um, a percentage-based reservation. Uh, there was not much change that was happening. Uh, people were, attempts were made to diversif pursue diversification of all kinds, but till such time, actual percentage was put in place and state and central legislation was put in place, uh, we didn't see much change. Do you think ultimately for us to achieve the kind of gender diversity that we want in our judicial institutions, the only hope is to put in a percentage-based reservation? No. You have the right to not to answer the question as well. No, no, of course not. I have very strong views on merit. I only said there should be a fair, a fair evaluation. You know, we have to have clearly laid down uh, parameters on which you will evaluate, you will assess. You know, there don't seem to be any parameters. Whether what about that, judicial services examination, ma'am, uh, reservation uh, for women there? That's what I was going to say. You know, where of an examination, you know, we have almost an equal 50% uh, Ch children who are joining the subordinate judiciary, I don't like to use the word subordinate, the ju judiciary at the entry point are women. You know, it's only when you get the chance choice option of using discretion is where the disparity is coming in. You know, our civil judges, our sub judges, our magistrates, you have an almost 50% ratio. And this is not only, I saw that in Delhi, I've seen that in Jammu and Kashmir, you know, and I have no reason to uh, to think that it's not the same in the rest of the country. So it's only where the discretion come, you know. Uh, women are not putting, being put in positions where they would be part of the choice making uh, group. So, you know, there are more and more women are being left out. I've heard uh, Chief Justice uh, Brenda Hale say this all the time. I've heard there are several, several other Chief Justice Georgina Wood from Ghana, Beverly McLachlan from uh, Canada, they all said they all their advice to women always used to be women in, in senior positions that make sure you fill your place with a woman because it'll never get filled by a woman. So it's where the choice is happening, you know, that uh, discretion that that uh, these kind of disparities are coming in. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, let me. There's another question which I'm going to ask uh, Miss Geeta Ramaseshan. This question is about where there's been while there has been an increase in the number of women entering the legal profession. How do you suggest one address 
uh, and this is a gender bias that operates in more uh, matters like allocation of responsibilities, uh, even uh, you know, giving of cases within uh, within a chamber to women or in corporate legal settings. To what extent, uh, even office spaces, the sort of more you know, slightly less significant but equally important aspects in which uh, the role of women uh, ends up being devalued. Uh, I, you know, so if I were to take, say, Nedra City, yeah, I think, uh, uh, as I already told you, now there is a, a situation has come that they want women lawyers, yeah. But if you were to take really other towns where, you know, women don't have much of uh, encouragement, uh, the challenge is much greater. Where, you know, you are then not encouraged to make a representation but just to take an adjournment. Uh, you know, not encouraged to, uh, yeah, just take an adjournment, give that much representation and come out. I think... Uh, I, I, you know, when I, it's, I think one way would be for young women lawyers to get together and start a firm, uh, you know, so that, uh, I know it's wishful thinking maybe, but, you know, it can be an area where then they can uh, get together and see how issues can be taken by them. But within an office, it is still very difficult. See, uh, Justice Mitchell gave us the example of sexual harassment at the workplace. Yeah, it's a huge issue now. You know, all courts are very uncomfortable with it. Uh, we don't have a proper structure. Uh, so, uh, understanding, uh, uh, you know, going and negotiating for yourself in a office is still it's still a very hierarchical profession. Yeah. Uh, if it, if you're working in an office and what we call, still we call people senior, right? There is a senior, then the senior calls the shots. Uh, so the, these are great challenges that pose us. I, 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 I have not exactly answered your question the way, you know, I, it's still, but that is how the challenge comes. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. Uh, Juma, since obviously the conference, there's another question about uh, you know, you know, when we are in the law school, if you look at law schools, for example, including ours, there are more than 50% uh, women who are law students. And so in some ways, what ought to be the responsibility of universities when it comes to uh, actively providing leadership in shaping the future of uh, a stronger role for women in law and the legal profession. How do we shape the agenda for the future? I think, uh, I mean, on, a, on an institutional level, what uh, one can possibly do and, and one way of doing it is uh, encourage uh, women because, you know, leadership role is not just confined to uh, faculty, uh, you, know, at, you know, in the institution. Leadership role is also confined to students. And if you make good student leaders in a law school, they are the ones who are going to step out, carry that experience with them, and they are the ones who are going to be the future leaders. And that aside, uh, I think there is also this, uh, you know, there, there, is a, there is a need to uh, sort of diversify. Because, you know, I think uh, Justice Mittal had uh, you know earlier spoken about this. Uh, that uh, you know there, there is there is this uh, uh, you know there is this tendency. There is this notion that women are only fit for a certain women lawyers in the legal profession. They're only fit for a certain kind of uh, practice and not for you know let's say uh, criminal law or tax law. You do not automatically think of a of a woman lawyer. Uh, that, uh, so uh, so maybe the, uh, you know that is another sort of you know that is another space where a law school can intervene by giving that space to uh, you know, students. Gotcha. Thank students. you very much, Juma. Ma'am, uh, you will have the last word on this, uh, Justice Geeta Mittal. Uh, you know, uh, Ruth, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg famously said the following, and I, 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 whenever I read this, I'm like, what a poignant thought process uh, as much as uh, it is, uh, it, it, it's as simple as that. So this is, a, this is something which she said, and I quote, when I'm sometimes asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And I say, 
court when there are nine people are shocked but there would be nine men and nobody has ever raised a question about that uncourt so my question to you is that um, what's the future how do we see how can we expect a change in the mindset and also change in the reality i am sure raj you are churning out young boys young men who think that their you know their women colleagues and women students and women friends are just as good at them when we can create that kind of a level and that kind of a mindset you know and when you're not it, um, you know you're not looking at differences but the similarities is when we will achieve that i always remember justice ruma pal you know she quote tells us about an incident in a lighter vein when in an argument in court in a case involving watching machines her male counterpart turned uh, to, you know turned to the lawyers and said you know my learned sister will be knowing all about this i don't so she, you know i'm sure you heard this this anecdote when she reacted and said where's the presumption how do you know now? what do i know about watching machines you know so you know and it was a, it's a very very emphatic statement um, which says a lot you know without any explanation being there but uh, the kind of expect discrimination where women lawyers are expected to do particular kind of cases is is you know it's the same on the bench you are assigned rosters which will not involve you know, now things are changing slowly and slowly but it's not also a 100% change and it's not across the board but there are judges who are willing to give difficult intellectual property matters you know commercial uh, uh, disputes company law matters to women judges i have been fortunate i've had a mix of both but roster allocations also is done very discriminately a lot of times and res responsibilities you will be given protocol branch housekeeping laundry you know the i don't know what do they call it livery branch you know to look after while as the male judges will get to do the computer it branch you know the these kind of assignments are given to the male judges so you know till we create a body of men who think that women are um, are no different from them and are able to overlook what are the real uh, you know are able to look at equality as a real real time reality is when you will have uh, equality on the bench as well well thank you very much uh, it's been an absolutely fantastic uh, session i am grateful to ms uh, justice geeta mithil uh, ms uh, geeta rameshan and of course my colleague professor juma sen for participating in this constitution day forum i also deeply appreciate your each, each one of your leadership in the work that we do and also to inspire many colleagues of yours uh, many mentees and of course others in shaping the future of the discourse relating to women law and the legal profession this session is ended we will be very quickly uh, in the next few minutes starting the 16th thematic session of the conference relevance of interdisciplinary legal studies during the pandemic um, and so um, and i want to once again thank uh, all of you for your presence thank you Thank you.